Hello and welcome to Insect Inseparable, my podcast series about how the smallest of arthropods impact the largest systems of human civilization. We'll talk about economics, agriculture, legislation, and a lot more on each episode. Be sure and stay tuned for the first episode, Entomophagy, the state of insect cuisine in the United States. Beetles, butterflies, bees, and back swimmers, moths, mosquitoes, mealworms, and maggots all on the menu to nearly a third of the people on the planet. Today on the show we're talking about entomophagy. That is the practice of eating insects. Now, if you're anything like me, this very thought leaves you in kind of disarray, but we'll make a deal. We'll do our best to look at the research, look at what science is telling us, look at how communities have evolved to need this, and we'll keep our minds open in that. So first thing we need to accept is that as many as 2 billion people annually take part in entomophagy. Nearly a third of the people on the planet. Now, if you were told that a third of the people on the planet do anything, would you think that that's inherently strange, inherently weird? Maybe, but it certainly gives us a place to start. So let's go, let's go a little deeper. After some simple examination, it's not hard to see how some of the creepers and crawlers find their way onto the menus and tables around the globe. For one, they are highly nutritious. Take mealworms. They clock a hearty 55 grams per 100 of pure protein. Another 19 grams of that is pure fat. And I'm not talking about the unhealthy comes. I'm talking about saturated, unsaturated, omega-3, omega-6, omega-47 if you want good fats, okay? All right, so crickets per 100 grams provide 58 grams of protein. Now, you might be saying, okay, Jordan, what does that have to do with anything? I don't know anything about protein in 100 grams. I don't know where that metric came from. Well, let me just say this. 100 grams of crickets isn't very expensive. You could get that for just a few bucks. Now, 58 grams of protein, which is what a cricket has per 100, is about as much as an adult male will need throughout a given day. All right, so there's some serious nutritional benefit to eating insects. Nearly half of the dry weight of an insect is protein. Some locusts even approach near 75% protein to body mass. Now that's, that's insane. If you think about it for other animals, it's not even close. With 100 grams of crickets just costing a few dollars, imagine how low those prices could go if there was higher demand for it. Right, so right now there's a huge stigma in the United States. Oh, well, eating insects, that, that's disgusting. That's what you do in third world countries. That's what you see Bear Grylls watch on, you know. That's what you watch Bear Grylls eat on the Discovery Channel, right? Well, if they were to catch on, um, doesn't matter how it was, how it happened. If, you know, it happened to go viral through, you know, hip teens suddenly finding themselves indulging in crickets on the weekends. Or if it were just subsidized through government means because they recognize the inherent value in feeding population, which we'll talk, to, talk about later. We can start to see that there's definite benefit to that if the demand were to, in fact, increase. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the second half of the show, but even as it is right now, the value per dollar you get out of eating insects far surpasses just about any other means of acquiring your protein. From someone who has a lot of friends who try to bodybuild, um, protein's expensive. There's no way around it. It's an extremely expensive substance um, to get daily, especially when you need to eat excess amounts of it. Another great thing about entomophagy is that it just might solve one of the great challenges facing us in this time. As the world population will increase over the next 100 years, to over 11 billion people potentially. The disaster that is the production of livestock continues to face higher demands and yet livestock as an industry is horrible. It is horrendous for the economy, horrendous for the planet, horrendous for everyone involved. So let me dig into that a little bit more. The numbers are clear. All right, to raise cattle, it takes acres of land, huge amounts of water and time, and 
all that just for a few pounds of protein, right? Like I said, insects are very protein dense. Cattle, chicken, I mean, it's better than some things, but it's still not great. And the amount of resources we spend on building up that industry are insane, right? So to produce the same amount of nutrients from insects, it would take 5% of the resources traditional agriculture would. In addition to being 20 times as nutritionally efficient, they require much less space, produce smaller carbon footprints, and produce far less waste. All right, so not only is it better for your nutrients, are you getting more nutrients per dollar, more nutrients per resource, All right? That's what economics deals with. Economics is just learning how to use scarcity and dealing with that problem. I'm sure many of you have seen statistics talking about how first world consumption is unsustainable in its current state. And as the first world dietary practices become more unsustainable as the population increases, entomophagy may be the place to turn for refuge. With the world population expecting to double over the next 100 years, some of the problems malnutrition, scarcity, and overpopulation could be reduced. Imagine being able to get 20 times your current gas mileage. Think about an electric bill that is 1 20th the current price tag you pay each month. The only thing that's in the way of something like that being achieved is the fear of eating something small and misunderstood. If you're like me, the fear of trying something this new and bold in the name of economic efficiency, might not be the battle cry you want to rally behind. But that's the thing. Entomophagy is nothing new. In the English language, we get to enjoy the use of words. One of these words is entomophagy. But in many other languages, a simple word for the same concept doesn't even exist. It's implied in the nature of the cuisine that insects are a part of dietary consumption. It's no new cultural phenomenon. In biblical times, diet consisting of locusts, grasshoppers, and crickets were permitted throughout the book of Leviticus. Now, for those of you who are still unconvinced that entomophagy just isn't for you, you might want to close your ears. You've probably had insect-based products and repeatedly this year maybe even this month. Common red dyes used in candy such as Skittles, Swedish Fish, and other reddish treats contain crushed insects. Often these crunchy candies can be a combination of nuts and crushed up arthropod. More commonly known, a lot of common shelved canned items have a certain limit to how much they can have that are contaminants. And I use contaminants with air quotes that you can't see. These contaminants can be, in fact, insects, and you'd be surprised with how high of a part per million count you can get away with. Now, you may be wondering, wow, that's disgusting, why would they allow that? Well, we'll talk about it later. Uh, long story short, there's no reason not to. But for now, I'll just leave you with a little bit of fact dropping. The average adult eats two and a half pounds of insect each year. Yes, you and I have a drought to somewhere around two and a half. Now, with that in mind, I decided to be bold, bolder than I usually am. I went looking for recipes. Now, I'm no cook, no chef, but I thought I'd give my hand a go with some of these insect cuisines. The thought of it made me squirm. But through a website, Precision Nutrition, I was able to find several recipes containing very minimal amounts of insect. Cricket flour, to be exact, was really the only ingredient that contained insect. But I thought I might as well not be a hypocrite. I should give it a go. So I found the recipe for cricket banana bread with coconut icing. I threw it in the oven and tried it myself. Long story short, here's the recipe. 
four medium ripe bananas, two eggs, one and a half cups coconut sugar, half a cup of mild olive oil, half a cup of cricket flour, there's the gem, one and three quarter cups whole grain wheat flour, two tablespoons baking powder, one and a half handfuls of walnut pieces, with the optional icing of one can of coconut cream, and one and a half tablespoons of runny honey. Now, long story short, I didn't throw up. I wasn't in love, but I didn't throw up. After a few days of thinking about it, I worked up the courage to eventually try it myself, and I could say that it changed my life, or I could say that my life was ruined because of it, my, my day was ruined, my afternoon, but neither of these were the case. Honestly, it didn't even really taste anything out of the ordinary. Cricket flour, as you can imagine, tastes kind of like flour. It's available for Amazon for pretty cheap, as I was saying earlier, just a few bucks for a significant amount. Well, I think it's a good time for us to take a break from the programming today. I'll let you mull over your thoughts as I give credit to some of the sources I've used this far. Be sure to tune in for the second half of our episode of Insect Inseparable, where I'll be talking about the economics of entomophagy. Hey, this is Jordan. I hope you've been enjoying the show so far. So I'd just like to take this time to thank the authors of the pieces I've been using so far to reference with the episode. Uh, firstly, there's a National Geographic article I referenced by Jennifer Holland, and this article just basically gave me an overview into the culture and the current state of entomophagy. Uh, next, we have the recipe I use. That comes from Precision Nutrition. Um, the nutrition facts for the bugs I use also comes from this website. And lastly, and most importantly, uh, Wyatt Hoback, Insects and Society, his textbook, is invaluable to me um, in the production of this podcast. His chapter on entomophagy was absolutely um, vital to the production of this podcast. All right, well, that is all for now. I'll reference the rest of the materials later at the end of the episode. So let's get back in, and we're going to start talking about the economics of entomophagy. Hello, and welcome back to Insect Inseparable, the podcast miniseries about how the tiniest of arthropods impact the largest systems of human civilization. Today we're talking about economics. So what I would love to do now is sort of shift the focus. We've talked about a couple of the main points uh, of which that I'd like to talk about, but I want to go a little bit deeper in. I want to talk about more about overpopulation and farming practices, and uh, how I want to start with that is I want to talk about legislation, actually. I want to talk about the legislation of the farming industry and how that relates to entomophagy, how it relates to insect farming. Um, so without further ado, here we go. So this is coming from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. They say regarding to the sustainability of insects, quote, insects have a high food conversion rate. Example gratia, crickets need six times less feed than cattle, four times less than sheep, and twice less than pigs and broiler chickens to produce the same amount of protein. So I'm sure I don't really need to spell this out, but I will just for the sake of argumentation. So when the world population eventually spikes above 10 billion people, which is projected to do in the next 50 to 100 years, it's very important to remember that we're going to need to feed all of these people, right? So when we can maximize something's efficiency, when we can take scarcity and use it to our advantage, that's something that is key to economics, um, key to an economical society. So in this case, um, a six-fold advantage as stated with the cattle and a four times advantage as stated with the sheep that is something that is going to be invaluable moving forward right so if the population doubles but we're able to quadruple or sextuple the amount of protein we're able to get out our farming overall is going to actually improve as the world population spikes another advantage to insect farming actually comes in the form of waste management According, According to, to AG Fund and they'll cycle later and later. They have a quote for that forty percent of the food in the US actually goes to waste. And when you think about that, that's pretty disgusting in terms of the amount that we're just leaving on the table when there's so much scarcity in the world. 
Well, when you actually weigh that against the fact that insects have no problem feeding on that same waste, uh, especially flies, it really speaks volume about what we can do with our limited resources, how we can turn a bad thing into a good thing moving forward. Now, as with any solution that seems to solve all the problems in the world, it really does, and it comes with its own set of challenges, and uh, I want to talk about those for a minute now. As things are currently set up in most first world countries, the legislation system hasn't been very involved with insect farms. So a lot of times when you have agriculture um, being a part of the business world, there's a lot of regulation that will protect people, protect uh, their rights to get a good product that's not going to make them sick or, or give them any sort of disease really. Well because for so long the idea of eating insects uh, has been so taboo, there's not really any legislation on the table that has to deal with this yet. So the sooner that there is action made on the front of entomophagy embraced in the United States, the sooner that legislation could get out there. Um, everyone knows how long it takes for any form of um, bill or regulation to make it through something like Congress, something. Now, some countries that are well off do have regulation in place. China is a prime example of this. Um, the companies that are out of China based insect farms, they have really been able to thrive because China has embraced them with their regulation and it sort of gives them a chance to actually thrive, actually make an impact into the scarcity of food. That leads me into my next drawback. So because these insect farms are so new in the United States, a lot of them are very small operations and without regulation and protection um, as a business by the by the government it's very hard for them to uh, fight the establishment if you will for them to take on more common forms of agriculture because they are so small by their very nature it's very hard for them to scale upward um, and take on these larger companies and so a lot of them are really just trying to find their identity find a way to make it into the market so the sooner that people embrace entomophagy in the United States, the sooner that these companies can start to make an impact and make a dent in the sales, because they really do offer a whole lot on the table. You know, besides human consumption, they also bring the option of feeding uh, the cattle um, in the current state of the industry. So if someone did still want to raise chickens or raise calves, um, it's something that's still very possible and very uh, integrous with insect farming because you could just make feed out of the insects and this is actually a far less expensive way than traditional to produce livestock and this does come with certain issues again the regulation is kind of a difficult topic because they don't really have any legislation in place to cover the fact that a disease may um, be transmitted to someone and there's no real cover for it as of right now. There's no uh, legal reformations that would be in place. Um, so the, you know, these insect feeding startups um, are starting to pop, pop up in the United States, but they're not the norm. They're not typical and they have a very hard time competing with little regulation and the, um, just the general stigma around them. Um, they're Tradition, agriculture is a very proud heritage. It's a very um, delicate craft, and a lot of people prefer the way that things have been done. And it's very hard to get um, people like that to embrace change overall. And so it's something that you'll just have to make clear that the bottom line is going to move so significantly that they just can't pass it up. And that's the message we need to be giving to the farmers of America. We need to be giving them the message of um, not only is it beneficial to everyone else moving forward. Well, not only is it beneficial to the planet in reducing pollution and waste, but it's also beneficial to them because they're having to pay less to develop these, uh, this cattle and their chickens uh, for their, you know, for the selling. Today we've talked quite a bit about entomophagy, so I'd just like to take a minute and supply some takeaways from the episode so that it's very convenient and you don't really get lost with the message. Firstly, over 2 billion people on Earth already intentionally consume insects. 
Now, the number of people who actually consume insects is much higher because of the food industry allows a certain number of insects. It's old news. We get it. Now, as the population rises in the next 100 years, it may become necessary to soon include insects in your diet. There is no way around it. It's something that ought to be embraced as soon as possible. Secondly, insect-based farming may be the salvation of agriculture. The inefficient industry can be strongly improved by increasing the amount of insects to be used for cattle and humans alike. Thirdly, insects are a great source of nutrition. If they were in implemented more ubiquitously into the American palate, over time they would grow to be cheaper um, than the traditional methods of meeting your daily protein intake. Remember that it's hard for a lot of these insect farms to launch in the United States because of the ongoing sigma. So why don't you get out there and try something new? Try them for yourself and see if you can bring yourself to embrace the practice. You might just convince some others to follow as well. This is Jordan, and until next time. Hey, this is Jordan. I'd just like to thank again the writers of the articles I mentioned in the second half, so I'd like to go through them again. AGFunderNews.com had a wonderful article that I used to outline the uh, some of the challenges that were faced by uh, insect farmers and some of the things they go up against. And for some of the pros, I got my material from Wagingen University. They had a great article talking about um, why insect farming will just blow us all away in the upcoming years. And I truly do believe um, of the importance of entomophagy. Uh, after doing this research, I, I do think that it's the way of the future. And with everything in me, I hope that the U.S. embraces it. And once again, I'd like to thank Wyatt Hoback. Um, his Insects and in Society textbook has done an excellent job persuading me, as I'm sure it has many others and many more to come, that insects and people are connected in many ways. Um, so I just want to thank him for making entomology fun. And that's all, folks. Until next time.